and welcome to Burley United Methodist Church's uh, worship service here for Sunday, November 22nd. We are grateful that you could tune us in and be a part of this, even though it's virtually, uh, but we are grateful that we can be together for where there is more than two are gathered. Uh, the Spirit is there with us. Uh, for those of you who've been active uh, here at the church in years past, we have been doing the angel tree, helping kids uh, for, for during Christmas, and the angel tree will be up after Thanksgiving. Uh, so if you can just, you can always just pop in and pick up whatever needs, and you can go buy these presents for these kids for Christmas. The office will be closed on Thanksgiving, which is the 26th and the day after the 27th. This uh, Advent begins next Sunday, the 29th, and our uh, annual Advent Bible study is taking a literary twist this year, and we are reading uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It's really a quite short book. Uh, if you either, uh, you can either pick it up, uh, it's on in the public domain, so you can pick it up right off the internet, or if you'd like a book uh, for $5, uh, you can pick it up here at the church. Uh, we will also be doing uh, this Bible study. Either you could show up here uh, starting at noon on the 29th, or you can come in uh, via Zoom. Either way, but either way, you're more than welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The first hymn this morning is, Now thank we all our God. Let us sing. The call to worship this morning comes from selected verses from Psalm 23. I'll read the light print. I'll ask you to respond in the bold. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please join me in the prayer of the day. O oh God, you have given us Christ who shepherds the church. He is the host when the table is spread. We praise your name and all goodness that you give us, their mercy which like oil anoints all of our lives. As we dwell secure in the sanctuary of your salvation, open to us the truth of your word. Lead us to serve you more faithfully as in Christ you have called us to do your will. And all of God's people said, Amen.
This is the children's sermon where I spend some time with the kids this morning. If there ever is a Thanksgiving that we need, it's now. Lots of people, giving thanks is hard for lots of people right now. Everyone has had to go without, without playing baseball and softball this spring, not spending time or playing with your friends as much as we wanted. If so, you've had a tougher time coming up with a list of ABCs this Thanksgiving, don't feel bad. That's what I'm doing this week, is doing the ABCs of Thanksgiving. And I'm doing the first eight letters, and I will ask you to work on the rest, okay? For A, the A for this Thanksgiving, the word is attitude. Attitude goes a long way to make the best of every day. Being in the army, I spent a lot of Thanksgivings away from my family, being on the other side of the world. But having an attitude of gratitude helped me a lot. And so A is for attitude. B in the alphabet of Thanksgiving is for believing. Believing that God's blessing are being given to all of us. As you believe God's promise for peace in your life, it will open up your eyes to all that you have to be thankful for. Jesus promises peace I leave with you, peace I give to you, not as the world gives it. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The C in our alphabet for Thanksgiving is choosing. You have a right to choose. You get to choose to be fearful and ungrateful, or you can choose to be thankful. Jesus tells us, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. If you're going to bear, for, if you're going to bear fruit, bear the fruit of goodness, righteousness, and justice. For we choose to be a thankful people who choose Jesus. My D word for Thanksgiving is a long word and that word is determination. It means that you are determined to thank God in spite of what has happened. And we have had a lot of lousy days this year. But we read in the Bible that all things work together for good for those who love God. As you are determined to thank God this Thanksgiving, you will find yourself in prayer and in giving thanks. E is another long word that I have this year, and it is enthusiasm. This fall, I officiated junior high and senior high football games. And most of the times I was the umpire on the, on the official, on the officiating team, which meant I st always stood on the defensive side of the ball. And sometimes these boys and girls needed some encouragement, especially when they were losing, and I gave it to them, trying to see the fun in playing. And I was enthusiastic when they were down. It is God's will that we are enthusiastic, rejoicing, prayerful, and thankful. St. Paul wrote, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. For this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that the ABCs begin with attitude of gratitude. From such attitude we'll be believing. God has determined that his best is in store for us and that we choose to be thankful. And in spite of the circumstances, we will be determined in our hearts and our minds to be thankful. F stands for faith. With faith in the living God who loves us and we are able to be thankful to God in spite of everything that happens. By faith we accept God and his word. The Lord is near to those who hurt. By faith, with an attitude of gratitude, God even can even give thanks, we can even give thanks 
to God in the midst of troubles, knowing that the Lord delivers. Now that we come to the letter G, G is a wonderful gift, word, and that word is grace, that which God provides. When we truly understand grace, we see that even if we have nothing else, we still have the wonderful grace of God in Jesus Christ. How we need to say thank you, Lord, on this Thanksgiving of all Thanksgivings, for it is God's gift of grace and every blessing is precious. And the last letter that I have for my ABCs of Thanksgiving is H, and that stands for hope. Hope means that there will be a tomorrow, that it will be a better tomorrow, that we don't know what tomorrow stands for, we don't know who holds the future, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. The most wonderful thing about hope is that we are not alone in wishing and praying for hope. The secret hope is found in being thankful this Thanksgiving. For the words that I've already shared with you, A is for attitude, B is believing, C is for choosing, D is for being determined, E, enthusiasm, F for faith, G for grace. And when I put all of these ABCs of Thanksgiving together to work in my life, I see that there are so many family members and friends and you that I can be thankful for. May these words from Psalm 100 be our prayer. Enter his courts with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. And our next hymn is, We Gather Together, Let Us Sing. This is Sunday before Thanksgiving. There are many things to pray for, including the people that we love. Please remember these uh, people in your prayers this week. Uh, the family of Jeannie Scott. Jeannie passed away about a week and a half ago, um, and there will be no services. Cindy McWilliams, I talked to uh, late last week. She is doing much, much better. Uh, and she is very grateful to be home. For Eleanor and Mervyn Woodbury, Dave Smith, after his uh, successful knee surgery, Wendy Hoffman, Richard Kicklider, Leanne Jorgensen Tinney, Brenda Marshall, and those suffering from COVID-19 virus and the frontline workers in their hospitals and clinics. Let us pray. Oh God, you are the shepherd of all Israel. You sent Jesus to be the shepherd of the church and we thank you for his love. 
which guides and nurtures your people. He cradles us in his arms and brings us back to the fold and to safety. He leads us to pastures where quiet streams flow. In the waters of baptism, we are made members of his fold. We thank you that we are numbered as the flock of Jesus, the good shepherd. He names us as he calls us to walk with him. He leads us in the journey of life that will take his followers. He teaches us what it means to obey. By his judgment, we know when we have strayed. By his mercy, we know when we have been saved. By your mercy, teach us the meaning of true righteousness. Help us to know what it means to serve your people in need. Where there is hunger, let us be the ones to offer bread. When others thirst, let us, us be the ones to offer the cup of cold water in Christ's name. Through us, may the stranger find a place to stay and the tattered and the naked be clothed. May our ministry serve as the keys to your kingdom, unlocking the gates so that your people enter the sheepfold. There may all find shelter and grow in faith and obedience as followers of him who fulfilled all of your will. We pray all these petitions this day in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples when he prayed to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we come to you this day aware of our shortcoming, but also aware of your amazing power and grace, for there is no condemnation for those who come with a contrite heart seeking forgiveness. You know that we live in a world that seems to take delight in fleeing slings and arrows, and all we seek is comfort and safety. Oh Lord, this church is one of those places where we feel at home, where we are restored and renewed. May we be bandaged up and sent out again with the reassurance that we are not alone, but that you are with us every day, every hour, and every minute. In our brokenness, we find fullness and complete acceptance. We love you, dear Lord. Amen. I'm almost at the point of not wanting to open up my Bible anymore. I seem to see a whole lot more on the web and on TV as well as on the playing fields of what I am reading about in Scripture and it is not heartwarming, but heartbreaking. More than once, I've seen someone at Smith's or received a text from someone, and they are asking me, how bad can it get? And I recite 2 Timothy 3. In these last days, terrible times will come. People have found that truth is not the end, but rather Power and enlightenment are the results of terrible times is failure. Whether this is failure in the, in, the, in the family or in the business or on the world stage, when countries fail, their people, it always has to the same reason, bad leadership. Either someone allowed failure to happen or even sabotaged it. A family or business does not go bad on its own. It just reflects badness. Churches can go off the rail too unless their pastor pays attention. Their record will show that whoever was in charge, whether it was Captain Smith on the bridge of the Titanic or Admiral Kimmel and General Short, at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Whether or not they were responsible, they were blamed. During the times of Kings Saul and David and Solomon, Israel 
was one land and their palace was in Jerusalem. After Solomon treated the northern tribes harshly and taxed them mercilessly, his son Rehoboam told the folks in the north, if you thought my dad was brutal, just wait. And those 10 tribes convinced Rehoboam's brother to move north to be their king. And in doing so, the country of Israel split between the north and the south. The north kept the name Israel and the south took on the name of the tribe of Judah. No north hangs around for about 200 years before they are conquered by the Assyrians. And then Judah is home alone until the last 150 years. And the last 40 of those years is during Jeremiah's time until Babylon rolls through again and destroys the city of Jerusalem. Chapter 23 of, of Jeremiah sees the coming train wreck all because of failed leadership. Jeremiah writes, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. 2,000 years after Jeremiah, the Protestant Reformation came about because the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church were focused on raking in money to build the Vatican, that they abandoned scripture and the people of their churches and told them, if you just pony up enough money in the offering plates, you will be saved. Horror, liars fallacy. It's like telling the church members today, all you have to do to, to go to heaven is by putting up your $1,200 stimulus check. That check is not going to get you one millimeter closer to heaven. Only faith in Christ Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, turning your life over to him and following Jesus will give you eternal life. Look over those pronouns and, and focus on, on them. It's the first person singular here in these opening verses. Nothing is more personal than the first person. Here God rails against the spiritual leaders for failing to fulfill God's calling. These words are not to you, not to the church members. These words are to me. These words that I take seriously. And I would venture to say some of my colleagues don't. I am so grateful though that my wife does because we are of one mind here. You are God's people, not kids. We read that instead of caring for God's people, their leaders ignored the needs of the people and they walked away. If a business provides poor products or poor service, their customers will not come back. We go to Smith's because they're selling what we're looking for. If I'm not offering you what you need, you walk. As the church, we have sought to be near God's heart. Four times in Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes in God's words, you are to be my people and I am to be your God. God is not a dictator. God is not the one so much that God is more of the one that came in the form of a babe born in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes. God took that extra step that you will be my people and I will be your God, that Christ came into the earth, to the earth not as a monarch, but as a Messiah born from a young woman named Mary. In the next chapter of Jeremiah, we read, and I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, 
and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. Literally, from, 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 from Genesis to Revelation, this relationship, this covenant with God is here that they and now we are to be God's people. When I wrapped up our sojourn last summer in the, through the book of Revelation, after everything is done, Jesus says, you are my people. He echoes what the prophet Jeremiah wrote time and time again. All of this started in the Garden of Eden in chapter two of Genesis. What a great idea it was, and it stays that way for an entire chapter. A short-lived dream, but in Revelation 19, it all comes back. And that shows God's heart. Time and time again, God and through the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and then Moses and Joseph, and then all the judges and the prophets, and finally Jesus and the apostles. All works or reworks to rebuild and to reconstruct that which was torn apart in the Garden of Eden until four chapters to the end of the book of Revelation. It finally is all brought back together. This love, like any love, cannot be forced. It has to come from the heart. You can't tell anybody Sit down so I can love you. That doesn't work. So does that work with God, with you? I can say it doesn't work with me. How tender and real is your relationship with God today? God wants that, but only if it works and only if that is what you want as well. That is why the, I think the terms in verse two are so harsh, leveling against the leaders for the people, for they have kept the people away from God. That's the exact opposite of what God wants. You have shed, you shepherds, have fed them pablum when they needed to feast on the bread of God's word. Here is my paraphrase of verse two. You will pay for what you have done to my people, God says. God does not tolerate bad leaders. Read the book of Samuel and Kings, and you will see that over and over again. The next handful of verses is what I call God's replacement plan that we will get to a little later, but for right now, I want to jump over verses three through eight and go to verse nine. Here we begin to see how Jeremiah got his nickname, the weeping prophet. Concerning the prophets, my heart is crushed within me. All my bones shake. I have become like a drunkard, like one overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words, God's holy words. The rest of chapter 23 is a detailed account of why Judah's false prom prophets are finished. Verse 10, for the land is full of adulterers because of the curse of the land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course has been evil and their might is not right. What a moral mess Judah is in. They are adulterers. Verse 11, both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house, your God's talking about the temple. Even in my house, I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. The people's godlessness is visible to even those in the temple, for they too are godless. And verse 14, but in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a more shocking thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen their hand of evildoers so that no one turns from the wickedness. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. The people of Judah have turned to their wicked ways. 
They have gotten control of the keys and they have made shambles of everything. Instead of being confronted and being told to stop sinning, the sin is now acceptable at the highest levels. In the book of Romans, Paul lays out the transgressions. One was to abstain from all, to abstain from, and not only were the Romans participating in these sins, they were approving of them as well. These false prophets tell the people that they have met with God and they have a message from God. I am more skeptical than a bit when someone tells me that they themselves have a word from God and I ask them, who else has this word come to? God has spoken to us through scripture and when someone in authority says, God has told me that from north is south and south is north, north I will more believe in my compass than in their false words. Verse 16, that says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They are deluding you. They are lying to you. They speak of visions in their minds and not from the word of the Lord. The other prophets are liars. Their ways and deeds are evil. If you follow them, you will sow the seeds of destruction and death. These false prophets say they are speaking for God. They say they have the credentials, but the words are full of bacteria. Even their words sound good. They sound pious, but they are anything but. Verse 25 through 31. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart. They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my, forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophets who dream tell the dream, but let the one who has spoke my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord, is not my word like fire, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. See, therefore, I'm against the prophets says the Lord, who steal my words from one another. See, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who uses their own tongues and say, says the Lord. They all sound good, but their words are worthless like straw. Straw has no resiliency. It blows in the wind. And verse 32 See, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, says the Lord, who tells them who leads my people astray by their lies and by their recklessness. When I did not send them or to appoint them, so they do not profit this people at all, says the Lord. This entire chapter is full of tough love. Starting in verse two and all the way through the end are words of judgment upon the people. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew, our Lord denounces the Pharisees not once, not twice, but seven times for their sinful ways of guiding God's people astray. Which road sign gets your attention better? Bridge out or dip ahead? It all depends upon your perspective. Both signs communicate the same thing but which one is sending you the correct message? Everything in this chapter is directed not to us believers. Keep true to the word of God. Make sure your yes is yes and your no is no. Your teachers of the word will face judgment. Preach what is here. Teach what is here. 
We jumped over verses three through eight earlier, and I want to get back to them now. Jeremiah writes, Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock, and out of the lands where I have driven them, I will bring them back into the fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. And I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they will shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall there be any missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved, and Israel will be safe, it will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives who brought out the lead, who led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the land of the north and out of all the lands he had driven them, then they shall live in their own land. Ever since Moses, the Exodus was the defining moment in Judaism. But here, God is saying, when I come, I will, super, I will supersede the Exodus because I will be in charge. The Exodus will become something remembered and it will become a remembering event. God will do all of this. And we looked at one of those times in Nehemiah. He was one of God's really last three rock stars after Jeremiah, after the exile, maybe where the 100,000 Jews were taken to Babylon in captivity. The first wave came back 50 years later, led by a guy named Zerubbabel. And then Nehemiah came 40 years later, and 20 years after him was Ezra, who came and rebuilt the temple. And the temple stood until 70 AD when the Romans destroyed it. Ezra wrote to the people of Jerusalem that you will first study God's word and you will practice God's word and then you will preach God's word. I'll take care of the third step, but all of us need to be involved in steps one and two. Study God's word and practice God's word. Let us revisit verses five and six. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up David's righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And in his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And who are we talking about here but Jesus, the son of David? He will rule justly with wisdom and righteousness. And this is what we are going to celebrate shortly at Christmas. He is the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. John writes Jesus' words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the flock the hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf come and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, that they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd. That is a fact. But is he your shepherd? That's the question. He is the Lord of righteousness, which we cannot because of sin and which we cannot be have righteousness without him. He is the shepherd. 
He is the Lord. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we come to you and we thank you that Christ is here in our midst, that though we have been separated for so long, he is in us and he will never leave us nor forsake us. We pray this in your name and all of God's people said, amen. And the final hymn this morning is Come Ye Thankful People Come. Let us sing.
And if there is a place to have thanksgiving, it is here at the church for we could give thanks to the Lord. And as we go this day, and as we celebrate, we have feasts to remember family, whether they're around the table or on the screen. Uh, let us be aware that God loves us and God watches over us. And for that, we do give you, O oh Lord, thanks and praise. Go in peace.